Welcome to Conservation Conversations. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe. Today, I'm thrilled to have a special guest with me because this is Bat Week. But before we dive into that conversation and that introduction, I'd like to share with you an opportunity to support NatureServe's vital work in preserving biodiversity. We've just unveiled an exciting addition and revamping of our Adopt a Species program, which allows you to symbolically adopt one of eight endangered plants or animals. And by doing so, you'll be contributing to the continued development of NatureServe Explorer, which is our online encyclopedia of biodiversity. Uh, not only that, you'll receive some fantastic perks related to your chosen species. So you can learn things and you'll get stuff. Uh, the cherry on top is that among the species available for adoption is the Northern Myotis, also known as the Northern Long-Eared Bat. And of course, this aligns perfectly with our guest, Dr. Winifred Frick, who is the Chief Scientist at Bat Conservation International. And this is Bat Week. And so what better way to honor these crucial creatures than to adopt one and provide financial support to NatureServe. To get started with your adoption, you can visit www.natureserve.org slash adopt. That's natureserve.org slash adopt. And make your donation to NatureServe and support the conservation of all kinds of biodiversity and in particular bats. And now without further ado, let's get into the conversation with Dr. Frick. I'm super excited this month to be here with Dr. Winifred Frick, who is the chief scientist at Bat Conservation International. And um, a lot of people are afraid of bats. People think bats are kind of creepy and gross. I love bats. And uh, I think they're so interesting and so fun. And I'm so glad that there's an organization that's dedicated to conserving and protecting bats. Um, and Winifred does great work there, um, creating evidence-based solutions for conserving bats, which is really important. And there's a lot of uh, threats to bats right now that we're gonna talk about because they're a really important part of the, of the world's biodiversity and they're, they play key roles in a lot of ecosystems. Uh, so uh, Winifred, welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm really pleased to be here. It's uh, a lot of fun, get to talk about my favorite subject, which is bats and bat conservation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that's your favorite topic. Um, so let's just start with some really basic information about bats in general, and then we'll talk about bat diversity and how many species of bats. So, right, it's the classic thing that we always have to remind people, just because they fly doesn't mean they're birds. Right, exactly. My uh, my son always uh, teases me because I always lead every bat talk I've ever given for his uh, school uh uh, class presentations with bats are mammals. <laughs> and he's like, mom, everybody knows bats are mammals, but you know what? Not everybody knows that bats are mammals. They don't. They don't. Yeah. So anyway, bats are mammals just like uh, we are. And um, they're, but they're, what's super cool is that they're the only uh, mammals that can fly that are capable of true flapping flight. And that um, ability to fly is really kind of what underscores some of the amazing adaptations and ecology and behavior and so many of the things that make bats super special uh, and wonderful. So, yeah. And bats aren't quite as size diverse as birds where you go from hummingbirds to condors say but um there's quite a size range in bats yeah i mean we have uh right now we're just over 1460 different species of bats around the world so as wow. you can imagine there's lots of different uh sizes and uh variability in there the smallest bat is the bumblebee bat that is in asia and it is um Super tiny. I've never had the privilege of seeing one. Uh, and the largest bat are, is in also in Asia and um, is one of the what we call the flying foxes. So right. those are the big um, species that actually have big eyes and they don't echolocate. Um, and uh, but they can get, you know, wingspans um, like over five feet and um, really big and impressive. How much would a flying fox weigh? Oh, goodness. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> It's a hand. It's a it's a big bat. Uh, I'd have to look it up to to refresh my. All right, it's not a problem. It's I. But at, with a five foot wingspan, and a lot of people have seen pictures of flying foxes. I mean, they're a substantial animal. 
Yeah. Um, and I can imagine the bumblebee bat is pretty, pretty tiny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You just let me know when you go on an expedition to find the penguin bat, because I'm coming, because <laughs> that's going to be the flightless bat that you know, does something yeah. really crazy. Yeah, the closest I can think of is there's a species in New Zealand um, that actually likes to like crawl around on the uh, on the ground um, and. Uh, and you know a lot of the a lot of fl flightlessness happens in in a lot of different island taxa because you don't have uh, predators. So, but they haven't they're not truly flightless. So, when I think about bats sort of crawling around a little bit, I think about one of the things that scares people about bats, right? It's in the, the so called vampire bats. So, we said one thousand four hundred and sixty species of bats, and almost none of them are vampires. That's right. There's only three species of bats in the world that are sanguinivorous, which is the uh, cool geeky science term for uh, blood feeding. Um, and yeah, so there's uh, one species, the common vampire bat, which is um, uh, kind of, the you know, well, like its name implies common and it is well distributed uh, throughout Mexico and Central America and South America. Um, but all three vampire bats are only found in the Americas. No relationship to Transylvania and <laughs> uh, any of that. <laughs> Completely <laughs> divorced from all of the vampire uh, legends of Eastern Europe. Um, but vampire bats are amazing uh, in their own way. Um, vampire bats are fascinating because they have um, really special social bonds with their colony mates. Uh, vampire bats really got the kindergarten message of sharing is caring. And the way that vampire bats... <laughs> know how to share is that if their roost mate didn't get out to feed that night, they'll actually regurgitate up their blood meal to share with their friends. So that's some, that's some serious friendly love there when you barf up your blood for your friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's sort of beautiful, but it also sounds sort of horrific, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, uh, <laughs> it's, it is sort of amazing. So they, well, let's just talk a little bit about vampire bats. So they're, they live in a colony and they have very tight bonds and they go out and how do they get the blood? Uh, yeah, so they have these amazing adaptations. They have really sharp incisors um, and they uh, they do not suck, um, but they have an anticoagulant in their saliva. Um, and they will actually, most commonly common uh, vampire bats these days feed on uh, cattle or horses. Um, and they will make a, a little uh, nick in uh, like maybe on the leg or somewhere um, uh on, on the body of a, of a large ungulate, and then they'll lap up um, the blood. Now, blood is mostly water, uh, and so it's really heavy. And so sometimes vampire bats will be like so heavy that it can be hard uh, to, to fly. And so they'll actually crawl. Uh, vampire bats are really good at um, at running. I, I have other friends who've who've studied putting them on on treadmills and and looking at their <laughs> their their ability to to run on a treadmill and then their metabolic um capacity um I'm, I'm gonna have to see if there's any videos of bats on treadmills on youtube because that sounds amazing <laughs> um, it's pretty cool <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about like the diversity of bats um and like their numbers but let's talk about the diversity in the things that they do so we've talked about obviously um the sanguinivorous bats, um, and everyone's very familiar with insectivorous bats and the ones that we see in, in the United States and anyway, in our backyard and things like that. But so let's talk about the range of things that bats do eat. Yeah, so most bats are insectivorous, um, and uh, that's sort of the ancestral state of bats, like the early, the, the first bats that we know about were insectivorous. Uh, all the bats here in North America, except for, um, in the southwestern U.S., where you're at the top end of the migratory range of some nectar feeding bats, um, are all insectivorous. So the bats, so bats that you might see in your backyard are uh, eating all sorts of nocturnal flying insects, moths, and um, and they do eat some mosquitoes, um, which we always like to thank them for. Um, and and then around the world, though, the diet of bats gets more more variable. So in tropical areas, there's lots of different pollinating species of bats that pollinate. Um, all sorts of plants, including commercially important plants like durian in Asia. Durian is a really favorite food uh, in Asia, um, and bats are the prime pollinator for that. Um, 
In Mexico, bats are important pollinators of columnar cactus. So, um, you know, the big iconic cactus, saguaro cactus in, in Arizona um, is pollinated by bats. And then bats are also the the pollinators of agave. Um, and of got, agave, of course, is the plant that we harvest for tequila. So we actually harvest agaves before they flower, but without bats, we wouldn't have agave plants. And so we always say, if you know you're enjoying your margarita, toast a bat. So um, I, I will keep that in mind next time. I'm, I've got plans this weekend for for margaritas. Yes, yeah, and then uh, bats also eat um, are important for seed dispersal, and so um, there's a lot of different fruit eating bats in the tropics as well, and they have a predilection for um, uh, figs. They love fig fruits, mm-hmm. um, and so they'll. Uh, you know, carry fig fruits through different parts of the forest and will maybe drop them in new areas. And so um, seed dispersal by bats is considered part of what keeps our rainforests healthy and um, can be helpful for also regenerating degraded areas because bats may be more willing to fly over um, like open fields. Um, And then there's all sorts of cool stuff too when you get into the tropics, like there's uh, species that specialize in eating frogs. Um, there's fish eating bats. Um, there's uh, there's these really cool carnivorous bats in the neotropics that eat uh, small little songbirds. Um, wow. So yeah, there's lots of different things on the menu for bats. <laughs> <laughs> lots of things on the menu. Um, you mentioned uh, migration which um, is a really interesting topic and, of course, relates to all sorts of conservation conservation issues because of habitat degradation and habitat availability for bats. So in, um, in North America, talk about bat migration and what happens and where they go, things like that. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, we're still learning a lot because bats are so small bodied and um, and that they fly at night. Um, we don't have some of the same technological tools in place to be able to study bat migration the way we understand bird migration. So, um, you know, sensors are getting smaller and smaller, but some of the um, geologging sensors you can put on migratory birds actually have like a little a solar panel on them to be able to recharge the batteries, but it doesn't work for bats because they fly at night. <laughs> and then they live in somewhere dark. And then they live in dark day. places during the day. So yeah. uh, battery life is a super uh, big limitation. So we don't have uh, as much knowledge about <clears throat> the individual long distance movements of a lot of species that we have for um, some of the, uh, some of our bird taxa. So, but in general, in in the U.S. anyway, and in sort of a typical um, sort of temperate um, uh, northern temperate um, you know ecosystem, both here in the U.S. both in North America and in Europe, you've got um, you know the majority of species are are hibernating, so they're uh, maybe doing seasonal movements between their summer grounds and their winter grounds, um, and those movements can be short distance or fairly long distance um, but they're they're not moving south for the winter necessarily what they're what they're looking for is uh, a place that is um, thermally stable to be able to escape winter so even though bats are mammals like we are they actually have more flexibility with their metabolic systems and they can literally chill out <laughs> over the winter where they can just turn their metabolisms off um, to save energy and so um, you know, that's what we call hibernation. So hibernation is, you know, a seasonal period of extended bouts of torpor is the technical physiological term. So bats will go go down to ambient temperature um, for a period of several weeks. They may arouse out of that um, state of torpor a few times during the winter, but they're basically, you know, they pack on the fat, as much fat as possible. Kind of like, I think this is maybe fat bear week or fat bear yeah. week just happened. So kind of like what the bears do. Um they put on as much fat as their little as their little bat bodies can handle. If you go catch bats this time of year, it's so impressive because they just get super chubby and they have all this. Um, like you can you can see the the fat um, build up on so their bodies, yeah. and then that fat has to last them until the spring until there's insects to eat again. Um, and then there's other species, m- many much fewer species that. Uh, do a long distance migration um, and 
most likely are moving south, although we've never uh, found exactly where um, all those species go in the winter. Mm. Uh, so. so I heard recently about um, some acoustic monitoring that was being done in Montana, and they discovered that bats are flying in the middle of winter in Montana occasionally. Yeah, I know. Well, so this is the thing, um, you know, we're learning so much about bats uh, right now, partly, uh, partly, you know, as technology advances, we have the ability to um, answer more questions, but also because of the disease of white nose syndrome, that was this terrible um, disease caused by a fungus that got introduced into um, upstate New York in 2006, 2007 is when the first bats were observed um, with the fungus while they were hibernating. That has um, really launched a, a huge uh, research and conservation effort to try to understand what's happening in terms of the disease and its impacts on bat populations. But um, as part of that, learning a lot more about um, the winter ecology of bats and um, and so we've, yeah, so we've learned bats continue to surprise us. They, you know, this is, uh, this is always a theme of like, they, they can do all sorts of things that we wouldn't necessarily think ahead of time that they were capable of doing. Um, yeah. I mean, when I picture a bat flying in Montana in the winter time, it just seems so cold and their tiny little bodies and their thin wings seems really risky. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I agree with you. I would not. I my dad lives in Montana, and and um, I can barely stand to walk around in the winter in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned white nose syndrome, which is something I wanted to talk about because I want to talk about um, the threats to bats, particularly uh, you know some of course nature serve. Uh, we care about all biodiversity, but our main uh, service area is really the United States and Canada. And this is where white nose syndrome is really a huge problem. Yeah. So you mentioned that it's a fungus and it was introduced from Europe. Mm -hmm. What is it doing to bat populations or what has it done? And are we coming out of it? Are bats developing resistance to it? Are we facing a bat apocalypse? What's what's the status? Yeah. So uh, we've lost over 90% of three species uh, to this disease over the um, past 15 years or so. It was first detected in upstate New York, as I said, in 2006, 2007. And um, since then, it has spread um, to the, the the fungus is uh, found in, you know, over uh, 30 uh, U.S. states and um, Canadian provinces. And um it's, uh, I think there's over 12 different species right now that have been detected to ha get the disease. Um, and uh, the three species that we're most concerned about, so northern long-eared bats, which uh, this spring were uh, um, finally placed as an endangered species, uh, received endangered species protection under the Endangered Species Act in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> uh, they've We've lost over 99% of the known wintering uh, colonies for that species. So it's been um, just a devastating um, uh, impact to that species. And we're, uh, we're, we're really worried about that species. Um, Tricolored bats, which are have been proposed to be listed as endangered on the endangered species uh, list, um, but are awaiting a final rule. Um, and then little brown bats um, have also experienced, you know, over 90% decline. So those are the three species um, that we're most uh, concerned about. And then um, Indiana bats, which are already an endangered species, have also suffered um, uh, declines throughout part of their range. Um, and so there's um, you know, there's a lot of concern, but there's also a lot of um, effort and energy and focus on trying to understand the disease. We know a lot more about um, uh, how how it kills uh, bats, and um, there's been a lot of investment in trying to think through conservation strategies. There's no silver bullet. Um, you know, wildlife disease is really complicated. Um, I think everybody, now that we've lived through the COVID pandemic, I think everyone has a much greater appreciation for the impact that novel diseases can have on populations. And of course, you know, uh, treating wildlife for disease is even harder than treating humans for, yeah. you know, um, 
So, uh, but there, there's, you know, there's promising lines of, of research. Um, at Bat Conservation International, the thing we've been focusing on uh, most recently is working on um, trying to help improve body condition of bats um, in areas that have been decimated so that we can help facilitate resilience and recovery. So, what we know is that the disease, the fungus um, infects bats when they go in, when they start their hibernation, and then um, it actually, um, it's a cutaneous infection. So it infects their skin tissues and that um, basically creates sort of a cascade of physiological responses that ends up disrupting their winter torpor and hibernation. And that causes them to burn up their fat reserves and then die before spring. And so there was some indication that bats that were coming into the start of hibernation in better body condition had a higher chance of surviving. So we've been working on ways in which we can um, support um, increased foraging efficiency near hibernacula. And so that we can, hibernacula is the term we use for the caves and mines where bats um, spend the winter. Um, bats go through Sounds this period. kind of Transylvanian, I have to yeah, say. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and bats go through this period where they uh, do like this hyperphagia, where they like try to eat as much as possible during what we call fall swarm, right before uh, winter hibernation. And they're really good at converting uh, calories to fat and they want to they want to get fat. So um so we call this our fat bat project. Um, and so we've been using UV lights to create um, a little, to attract um, natural insects near the hibernacula and then seeing if the bats will uh, forage at those UV lights during this um, fattening period. Uh, and what we have found is the, the bats do feed at our bug buffets. Um, <laughs> and so the, the goal is to try to yeah, we call this our, you know, fat bats of the bug buffet project. So <laughs> um, it, sound, it sounds it sounds silly when you say it that way, but it's so important for species that have lost 90 to 99 percent of their population in 15 years. You would think it would be hard to just even find a mate, much less, you know, survive for the for the long term. Yeah. And body condition is just like such a good driver of like survival over winter, but also reproduction in the spring. So bats are um uh, a typical life like annual cycle for a bat is that actually males and females um mate in the fall typically and then the females will store sperm or delay gestation until the till uh, over winter and then when conditions are right and the females emerge from hibernation they've got to emerge from hibernation and then get to their summer maternity sites and then um initiate gestation and have their pups um in early summer and so having a good body condition underscores all, all of those, um, conditions. So how, how many pups will they have? Oh, just one. So, um, uh, this is a big difference between bats and birds, right? Like, um, birds have solved the problem of like, you know, flying, but then reproducing by laying eggs and you don't have to carry the eggs around. Right. But bats are mammals. So they've got to have, uh, they got to fly around pregnant. <laughs> So you really don't want to have very many babies if you're flying around it, pregnant. It makes population recovery a little more challenging because That's each right. bat, each female bat can only have one pup a year. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So they're constrained in their life history in terms of their ability to respond. Um, and so adult survival is super important to their population dynamics. Um, yeah. And they can only have one pup per year. And because they mate in the fall and then the females actually uh, group up and have a colony together um, and, and kind of uh, do a synchronized, they all kind of pup at the same time and are, are clustered up together. The guys are all sort of chilling out by themselves and in different places or yeah, by the, you know, in little either bachelor roosts or, or solitary, but the females all kind of group up together and have their babies. And so if you lose a colony in the summer, like, A, the females aren't going to, like sometimes if birds get dis disturbed early in the yeah. season, they can double clutch and try yeah. again. It's like game over for that season for bats. Um, and and then also because they're in a colony, if you if you lost a roost tree or something, um, then that the reproduction gets kind of wiped out for that whole colony. And the bats in, in North America that we're talking about, how long will they live? 
So that's the other cool thing. Bats are so different than most other mammals. Um, even though they're small bodied, most small bodied uh, mammals only live for a short period of time. And I think the current longevity record for a little myotis, which is actually one of the European myotis, which is myotis dobentonii, is 42 years. What? So, yeah, if you look at it like in a you know, like ecology textbook or something, you'll see this famous graph that's like, you know, uh, body size of a mammal and then like longevity uh, of a mammal, right? And like most mammals, there's this, you know, allometric relationship with like your longevity is related to your body size. Lo bigger animals live longer. Right. And then there's like this crazy data point that's like way <laughs> off like as an outlier that's like a really small bodied animal that lives a really long time and that's bats wow that's so interesting yeah it's amazing they can pull that off yeah um, and so in north america how many i mean we talked about some species that are affected by white nose but how many species of bats are there in our there's homework? about 45 species about 45. yeah and other than white nose syndrome so before white nose what were the biggest threats to bats in north america so the biggest threats to bats in North America, besides um, white nose syndrome, uh, the most, uh, the biggest direct mortality threat is wind energy turbines. So um, bats are um, unfortunately killed in large numbers by uh, wind turbines, and so as we start to see more and more um, investment in wind energy, which obviously we uh, need to, to meet our um, goals for decarbonization and fighting climate change. We need to ensure that um, these new uh, infrastructures that we're putting on the landscape don't actually drive biodiversity loss. Um, there are ways to operate wind energy turbines that can um, that are compatible with um, not um, killing large numbers of bats, but it takes some uh, regulation and some in, uh, uh, in incentivization because right now the best ways we know how to do that is through what we call curtailment, which is changing the the cut in speeds that we allow the um, blades to spin. And so it does cause a loss of power generation. And so um, that's not necessarily um, the first choice of of, of wind uh, energy developers because they're in the business of wanting to make as much power as possible. Um, and then the other big uh, driver of a uh, big threat, of course, is habitat loss. And that's, you know, that's here in North America, but also the world over. Yeah. Um, and so um, thinking about making sure that we have um, you know protected forests and um, protected landscapes and um, and and thinking about ways that we can restore natural landscapes too to be able to provide the best bat habitat. You know, bats need safe places to sleep and safe safe places to eat. So it's kind yeah. of a combination of protecting roosts but also protecting foraging areas. So one of the things that I'm sure you're pulling a lot of this information from your recent report, The State of the Bats um, in North America, which is a new report that you all just came out with. So I want to give you a chance to talk about the work of Bat Conservation International and what you found in uh, the conservation status and threats to North American bats. I mean, I think we've covered a bunch of it probably, but just want to give you the open floor to yeah. Do, a, do an infomercial. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Bat Conservation International is a nonprofit. We're based here in the U.S., although we uh, our, our focus is global. Our, our mission is to end bat extinctions worldwide. And uh, we have projects all over the world in which we're focused on um, endangered species interventions. You know, we identify sort of we use IUCN and, and, and other um, information to identify the species that are at, at highest risk of um, uh, of of extinction and and then we um and we work with local um, communities and uh, local partners to try to um, put um, measures in place so like for example we have a project in Jamaica where there's a critically endangered bat that's endemic to Jamaica and um, it was it's known to only one single roost site one cave that's all that's left if we lose that cave we lose that species um, mm -hmm. so we've been working with the Jamaican government uh, successfully purchased um, the land so that can be managed and protected by the Jamaican government and ensure that that uh, cave roost is is protected and that species has um, a safe refuge 
Um, and, and then we also work, so we work on habitat protection and restoration in lots of different contexts of so thinking about ways in which we can, um, provide resilient landscapes for bats. Um, and then we do a lot of, uh, what my primary, uh, job is as a chief scientist at BCI is, um, really working on, you know, what are the, what are the important research questions that we need to answer to be able to enable effective conservation? So where are our data gaps and our knowledge gaps and how do we bridge the knowledge to implementation gap and get solutions on the ground, um, for bats? And, that's where a lot of our work on, you know, we uh, work with conservation evidence, which is this great um, program in, in Cambridge um, that's compiling all the known information for different kinds of conservation actions. Um, and we just, we don't have, um, you know, the, there's still a, there's, there's a real paucity of evidence for the effectiveness of conservation actions for bats. So we're, we're working as hard as we can to try to <laughs> build that evidence base. Um, uh, and, but by taking action and like, you know, putting things uh, into place and then measuring, you know, what works and not, and not. So uh, that's a very, like, very quick, like, you know, high, uh, high level uh, flyby, but um, you asked about the state of the bats uh, report. And that um, was a report we came out with um, this past spring in collaboration with the North American Bat Conservation Alliance, which is an alliance of folks from Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, um, recognizing that trilateral efforts in collaboration across um, borders is really critical for wildlife populations. One of the things that's um, characteristic of bats is they tend to be fairly wide ranging. And so most of our species cross international boundaries, even we, when we have countries as big as the U.S., yeah. right? <clears throat> um, so uh, we worked with um, 100 different experts across those three countries, um, used the nature serve um, criteria and process to do a status assessment um, of all the species in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, um, and looked at their uh, nature serve rankings, um, and had experts um, uh, go through and look at um, uh, different threats. And um, so, yeah, the nature serve process was like super um, uh, foundational to to the work of that report, um, and and that gave us a a, a pretty um, solid overview of like what the major, uh, what the experts think are the major threats to bats, uh, across those three countries. Um, and let me just say for, uh, people listening, um, we'll have this linked on nature service website, but the, if you go to bat conservation international's website, this report is just beautiful. And if you ever wanted to look at pictures of bats and be like, wow, those are some handsome creatures. The photos in the report are just fantastic. Yeah, we were really lucky. There's some really great folks who have really um, just been doing an excellent job with bat photography. As you can imagine, bat photography is um, very challenging, very challenging, yeah. and a super kind of niche thing to get into. And um, there's just there, we were really lucky to work with some great folks like Charles Francis and Canada, and um, some other, other they're just real and Brock Fenton who just really have uh, mastered the art of because you know most people like you started off with like a lot of people uh you know bats can look kind of unusual and and you don't really ever get to see them up close and um sometimes people think of them as being scary especially since they get portrayed that way a lot in in our in our common culture but um when you have the chance to see bats in the hand and up close they're, they're just remarkable. They're just so cool. And I think that I, I agree with you. I was really proud with the, of the, how the report came out of, I, I feel like it gives you a great sense of just how fascinating and interesting and variable bats can be. Yeah. So people should go to batcon.org and take a look at that. Um, and you mentioned um, holding bats and seeing them up close, which is something you've been really fortunate to get to do. So I um, wanted to, I always like to talk to people who do field work and find out like, tell me some great adventure or some amazing discovery you had from your field work. Oh, I love this question. I have so many good field stories. We could do a whole thing. Um, but I'll, uh, I think one of my favorite um, field stories is 
recently, um, I had the privilege of being part of an expedition uh, with um, colleagues from Africa where uh, we were working in Yungwe National Park in southwestern Rwanda um, to look for um, Hill's horseshoe bat. And this was a species that had, had only ever been caught twice. Um, it's only known from this one watershed within Yungwe National Park, which is some of the, uh, it's a montane Afro, um, African rainforest, um, some of the oldest forest on the planet. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, the bat had not been seen in 40 years. It hadn't been seen since the early 80s. And uh, it's critically endangered by IUCN. And there was a real strong desire to try to determine whether or not the bat was still extant, was still if there was a population there. And so in 2019, uh, we were there, we ran a 10-day expedition, and um, we set up harp traps, which are a trap that has a rigid frame and monofilament line, and the, the bats are trying to fly through like a you know a tight forest trail, and they hit the monofilament line, and they, they flutter down into a bag where they can kind of wait uh, safely, but not get back out. And uh, one morning we came in to go check the harp trap and lo and behold, there was this totally bizarre looking animal in the trap. I mean, Hills Horseshoe's bad are, um, uh, uh, maybe we can post a link to a photo um, for the podcast so people can see what they look like. They have a very unusual face um, and uh, and we knew right away that it most likely had to be uh, this species. We took all the measurements and then we uh, released it uh, back into the to the forest. And um, after we we took a little small um, tissue sample so we could confirm the genetics and we took all the measurements and sure enough, it was Hills Horseshoe Bat. Um, then we had to wait because of COVID, but we got to go back last year and mm -hmm. we actually successfully caught another one and radio tracked her back to her wow. roost tree. And so we discovered the first roost um, for the species and there were like eight individuals in there. So it's, um, she was living with, uh, eight other, eight, eight other bats, probably a maternity roost, probably a group of females with that were living together to have their pups. So that's so there. awesome. Yeah, um, and amazing. while technically was still listed as just critically endangered for a species <laughs> to not be seen for 40 years is a pretty bad sign. Um, yeah. now, now we can do something to help, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, um, our colleagues in Rwanda with the Rwandan Wildlife Conservation Association and with uh, African Parks, which manages Nyungwe, and the Rwandan Development Board um, are, we're monitoring that roost tree. We're making sure that it's protected. We're um, working with the rangers. Um, the Nyungwe rangers are amazing and they uh, work all over that park and they're documenting other trees that um, could could be potential roost trees so that we can make sure that we protect. Um, they, so they, these are basal hollows. Like uh, I live here in California in the redwood um, forest and um, it's actually very analogous in that um, here are bats. There's a number of bat species that like to live in the basal hollows, which are, you know, the big like uh, cavities that occur in the redwoods. The most of our redwoods were cut down around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's very few of those features on the landscape. Well, likewise, um, in Yungwe, even though it's a beautiful forest now and that part of the world has been covered in forest for a long time, a lot of that forest was cut down. It's it's all uh, regrowth. So these big basal hollows are fairly rare on the landscape. But those are those are like caves to bats, right? They're right. Um, uh, and so protecting those big trees and those basal hollows is um, a high priority for the park. That's really cool. That must have been a really exciting trip. And I think it's also awesome to sort of have one in the plus column. Um, yeah. Because often the news in our field is very depressing. And uh, like I said, to discover something and then to also be able to put in place conservation strategies to help that species is so exciting. And it's really, I find it sort of a very hopeful story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's really neat. Um, we also got to discover, uh, a new species in, in West Africa, um, about that same time. And so that was also really, that was like, sort of like the dream come true is yeah. like to describe a new species. So Especially a new species of mammal. I mean, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And this wasn't necessarily, this wasn't like a, Oh, we're splitting a species that had was, it was, you know, we, we caught oh. this 
and again, it was pretty, a pretty, um, you know, some bats you catch and it's like, well, there's no way we're going to be able to identify this without the genetics. Cause, uh, there's nothing particularly distinct about it. And there's lots of closely related species and, and cryptic species. This was a, um, fantastically unique, uh, animal with, uh, uh, orange fur, um, bright orange, um, and black, like striking, uh, black and orange, uh, wings, um, and really unique characteristics. And yet when we went to go key it out, there wasn't, there was, it was, it didn't fit. That's awesome. Um, yeah. so you, uh, have had a career as a chiropterologist. Is that spelling? Did I say it right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what inspired you to go into this field? Was there some person or some event that caused you to want to do this work? Yeah, I was always interested in conservation and um, I was uh, between undergrad and my and grad school and I started um, uh, uh, volunteering with somebody who was a, a local uh, bat biologist here and um, and we and we fell in love and I fell in love with bats. So we're we're still married. And <laughs> um, uh, I I actually I had uh I had wanted to go back to grad school to um, maybe potentially work in Africa because I had I had gone to Africa um, uh, shortly after my undergrad. Uh, but then, um, yeah, then fate took a different turn and it became became bats and a love story all in one. Yeah, so that's very sweet. There's yeah. not an expression like birds of a feather flock together. Is there some we don't have a thing for that for bats, do we? No, we do, we don't. But Even my friend, husband, my, my friend and colleague Craig Willis, uh, who studies um, hibernation, w- really worked hard at getting everybody to try to use the term "cuddle" to refer to a group of bats that were hibernating together. I mean, they do sort of like hang out and they're yeah, they do they cluster other. and like he was yeah. like he was just like well, let's call it a cuddle of bats. <laughs> so it sort of look that way. I think that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, is there any other uh, messages related to bats or bat conservation that um, you want to share with the listeners? I mean, I just say that, um, you know, uh, I'll just underscore how cool bats are in that we um, bats need advocates and friends and enthusiasts um, like a lot of nature. And um, people often ask, like, what can they what can they do to help? And there's, um, you know, uh, anything that you do to uh, lower your carbon footprint, anything you do to, um, contribute to, uh, a healthier planet helps bats because they share the planet with us. Um, and, uh, yeah, tell, tell your friends and, and family how cool bats are. They are cool. I really, I, I love them. And, uh, I also noticed on your website that you have a link to bat friendly tequila brands. So that's a, another yes. thing. For small contribution people could make. Yeah, yeah, uh, and come, yeah, and at the end of October is always Bat Week, and so uh, look for um, you know cool stories about bats and um, and other activities that people might be uh, engaging in for celebrating bats as part of our natural heritage. Awesome. Well, Dr. Winifred Frick, thank you very much. Um, it's been really. Um, it's been really fun for me because I get to uh, just quiz you about bats and ask all the questions I ever wanted to ask about them. And uh, you have the answers. It's so it's so wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's been really fun. Thanks so much. I um, It's really great to be on the show and um, get to talk about bats. Great. And we look forward to um, working with BCI in the future. And um, thanks for all your great work. Yeah, thank you. This has been uh, Conservation Conversations, and it is back Bat Week, actually, right now when this show is being released. So hopefully you're getting to take advantage of that um, and doing finding some interesting bat things in your own community. And we will see you again next month on the show. Thanks for joining us. been another episode of Conservation Conversations, the podcast from NatureServe, the protectors of biodiversity in North America and nature's tech firm. 
We ask you to support us. We're a nonprofit organization, and uh, we have some fun ways to do that. Uh, as we talked about at the opening of the show, you can adopt a species by going to natureserve.org slash adopt and adopt one of eight plants or animal species, including uh, the northern long-eared bat which would be a fun one to do this week during Bat Week and uh, on the heels of learning so much about bats. Uh, it was a really fun conversation with Winifred Frick and um, really makes uh, makes you want to be a chiroptologist, chiropterologist, you know, somebody who studies bats. 